Hello everyone, I'm Jared O'Reilly and uh, together with Professor Jean-Michele Calvi we're going to speak a little bit about the seismic risk classification of non-structural elements. So the first question is what are exactly are non-structural elements? Well essentially they're the components that don't form a part of the building structural system but they're in any case subjected to the shaking and deformation in the building. So if we consider the left hand side we see the actual structure whereas on the right hand side here we consider the actual building components and uh, different fixtures and fittings and services located with, within the building. The different kinds of non-structural risk have been described in FEMA E74 and essentially we have three different kinds. We have the life safety risk, the property loss and the functionality loss. So can anybody be hurt by an earthquake, or by a non-structural element in this earthquake? Or could we have a large property loss or a large financial implication of this, um, of this element's um, loss during an earthquake? And also could the loss of this element, this non-structural element, cause an outage or an interruption that would have a big impact on the functionality of the building? So some kind of classification scheme uh, that would account for these would be something that, uh, that we're trying to um, target here. So what about the significance of these? Well, consider that building codes typically focus on the ultimate limit state of a building. So what they're trying to do is uh, limit the collapse of a building in order to save the lives or protect the lives of, of, its, um, of its occupants. Whereas the design and the consideration of non-structural elements is maybe a more secondary consideration. So it's something that comes afterwards. So once you have the building, then you, uh, you follow some rules to check and verify that the, uh, there are no major issues with the non-structural elements. Um, but following these kinds of approaches that generally exist, it's not easy to know the actual margin of safety for different kinds of elements with different kinds of risks as subject to different kinds of uh, demand parameters like floor accelerations or, or displacement or drift or stuff like that. So if you consider in Italy, there is a recent guideline called Sisma Bonus, which, uh, which tries to um, tackle a similar issue but, uh, but different. Um, basically what they're doing is trying to classify and rank different kinds of buildings using this, uh, this uh, classification scheme shown on the bottom right. And the idea is that using this kind of scheme, a building can be ranked and tagged with a rating like B, for example, and we know that the building next to it has a ranking of E. So it's quite clear that, uh, that the different kinds of risk of those kinds of buildings uh, are easy to, to, to quantify and to communicate to other people and describe the risk associated with them. So um, it's obviously clear and more straightforward. And this is something we're trying to propose here in the case of non-structural elements. So we have different uh, sensitivities, we have different kinds of elements and different kinds of risks. So uh, some kind of classification uh, scheme like this to simplify and, and break down its communication to people is what we're uh, essentially targeting. So if we consider the quantification of non-structural element performance, we're essentially looking at three things. We want to look at the hazard, we want to know something about the hazard, we want to know something about the demand intensity model, and we also need to know something about the fragility function of the building, uh, of the non-structural element components um, themselves. And if we combine these together, we can compute something called the mean annual frequency of exceedance. So what is the mean annual frequency of exceeding the, the damage limit state of that non-structural element? If we know this, we, we, we already know quite a lot. Um, but also given that we know these different damage states for the non-structural elements, we know that some of these may or may not be associated with different kinds of risks. For example, the life safety um, risk we had previously mentioned is something that you would uh, associate with something like the collapse of a ceiling system, for example, or the collapse of masonry infills that could potentially harm somebody who is who's located nearby but also the functionality loss of a, of a key component in a, in a factory for example this would be a functionality loss so if we can tag each one of these damage states with a different type of risk estimate that risk uh, the mean annual frequency of exceeding that uh, that particular damage state we can begin to classify, compare, and rank each of these risks with uh, with respect to each other in some kind of system to um, similar to what we had mentioned with that uh, with Sisma bonus. So the inputs uh, are exactly as I, I I'd mentioned before. So the site location, hazard, structural typology, and its demand intensity model, the fragility of the non-structural elements, and some kind of decision framework uh, to assign this risk rating. This is the key here. So what would this uh, risk rating decision framework look like? Well, we know we have three different kinds of risk. So the life safety, property loss, uh, and functionality loss of, uh, of different kinds of uh, non-structural elements. If we were to assign an acceptable mean annual frequency to each one of these and compare them along a ranking system in a, in a graph, something, uh, something like we're showing here, 
this is already uh, quite a big uh, big improvement so essentially what we're saying is we can compare based on the uh, acceptable mean annual frequency of exceedance we can estimate a ranking or we can compute a ranking for each one of the uh, non-structured elements depending on the type of risk this of course uh, establishing this kind of graph is not easy, of course, and uh, it would require uh, a, a lot of research and collaborative efforts to to determine suitable values for uh, different kinds of um, elements, components, and, and risks, of course. Um, but we're arguing that it's a more meaningful way to classify and rank the performance of the non-structural elements because it, it, it directly compares risk with risk. Okay, it ranks them, but it's comparing the risk of failure of one kind of element with the risk of failure of another one. And it doesn't rely on demand capacity ratios that current codes would typically employ. Um, so uh, we, you would wonder how, how suitable it is to compare the demand capacity ratio of a uh, acceleration sensitive component to a drift sensitive component. Maybe they're not so compatible, those ratios. Whereas in this case, the risk is still compatible with risk. So this is, uh, this is the advantage of what we're proposing here. So how would this be implemented then? So what would an example application? Well, we consider a case study building, and we look at two different kinds of uh, non-structural elements. So we have gyps and partitions and a cooling tower. So we have two different kinds of demand parameters, story drift and floor acceleration, and two different kinds of risk, property loss and functional loss. So when we're trying to implement this, and of course these is, the, the, the details are explained a bit better in the paper. I'm, I'm obviously jumping through things here to, to save time. But the, the first thing we need to know is something about the site location, you know, the, the seismic hazard. We would need to know something about the demand intensity model. So this, this is something we can uh, compute using um, incremental dynamic analysis, for example, in this, in this specific case. We need to know uh, the relationship between the story drift and intensity measure, and also the floor acceleration and intensity measure of the, the particular building, and also some information about the fragility functions of the, of the components. So this, this could come from something like the experimental testing of, the, of these components or, or databases or libraries of, of fragility functions for uh, these non-structural elements. So something like PACT or, or, or something similar could be, could be of, of great use here. Um, then when all of this gets implemented, so the equations and the, the steps to implement this are not described here, but they're, they're available, of course, in the paper. We see that the three ingredients that we had uh, collected previously, the site hazard model, the demand intensity model, and of course the non-structural element fragility functions, these would be the, the first sets of, of data that we would have um, to uh, go about and compute the mean annual frequency of exceedance of uh, a particular damage state of, of these, uh, these two non-structural elements. So we see when we follow these, and it's described again in the paper, that we have uh, this lambda, this uh, mean annual frequency of exceedance of 4.61 uh, by 10 to the minus 3 for the gyps and partitions, and this value here for the cooling tower. So already here we have a risk of both of the components that we can maybe go and, uh, and try and classify and, and then compare. So if we use this, uh, this example that we had seen before, this graph, uh, for the case of the gyps and partitions, essentially all we're doing is we're just entering in the, the, the left-hand side here, and because we're focusing on a property loss, we see that our ranking is going to be a D rating or a D, a D rank of, uh, of, uh, of performance. Whereas in the case of the cooling tower, because we're more concerned with functional loss, uh, we enter with the same value, the same lambda, and we uh, read off the corresponding value here for uh, the functional loss. And we see that we have an E rating, which is uh, which is would be would be more critical. So what we're seeing here is that even though we had a gypsum partition, uh, type of element which is sensitive to story drift located everywhere in the building and uh, we're concerned with the property loss of it we're able to directly compare it its performance to a cooling tower which is a, uh, located just at the roof of the building sensitive to floor acceleration and we're concerned with its functionality loss not the property loss but we already have a kind of unifying system where we can uh, rank and compare both of these um, both of these uh, two non-structural elements to uh, to one another so the advantage here is, uh, if we follow all of these steps and we get to a situation like this, we could have different kinds of non-structural elements where we can see that some perform better than others according to this kind of ranking system. And we could see that maybe this kind of cooling tower is not what we should be installing in the building because it has quite a poor performance. So maybe we should be trying for something better or we should try and improve its performance with better restraints or better kind of isolation system or something like that to improve its, its ranking.
Um, and, and likewise for the Jupes and partitions, maybe D is not good enough for us uh, in this situation as well. So it gives us an idea of the relative performance of the non-structural elements. So if we consider the problem on the, the opposite direction, so let's say we start off and we know the building, we know it's going to be designed as a reinforced concrete frame, and we have its model, we have everything we need to know, some details about what kind of structural element or what kind of resistance we need now for these non-structural elements. And we want all of these to have at least a ranking C, for example. We would essentially come in here, we have a ranking C here for all of the property loss, um, all of the non-structural elements which would have a, a property loss uh, function or, or, or sensitivity. We would essentially know that the mean annual frequency of, of exceedance for those would correspond to this value here. And if we follow the steps we have just done backwards, we'd essentially, uh, we would be able to tweak and, and, and modify and maybe select better non-structural elements that would be um, have a more uh, harmonized or uniform risk uh, throughout the building. So this has a, an advantage in, in that sense also. So to conclude, um, a risk classification scheme for the non-structural elements has been described, and we're essentially using mean annual frequency of exceedance to do this. It uses information based on seismic hazard, structural analysis, and also the non-structural element behavior to characterize this in a more consistent manner. Um, something we didn't mention, but it's also important, is the incorporation of uncertainty, and it's in line with um, say what we call modern um, performance-based earthquake engineering. It's similar to uh, what we've seen with uh, seismal bonus, how we can classify and compare in a more simplified and, and, um, and uh, understandable way. Uh, but of course we need future work to, uh, to identify what these acceptable performance limits would be. Um, but of course the, the main objective here was to put forward this kind of classification scheme and, and try and get the, um, um, the general idea out there to um, hopefully be adopted in the future. And we also we saw some example imp implementation which uh, of course is, is described better in the paper. And that's all from me. Thank you.